good morning. It's good, good to see you this morning. Come on, stand up with me and let's let's worship. We're gonna start out with this old hymn. Start with me. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood, and this is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior. my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of rapture, now burst on my side. Between us, by the cross you came and 
your grace we are no longer bound, no longer bound. You call me out of the grave, you call me into the light, you call my name and then my heart came alive. Your love is greater, your love is stronger. Coming back to life, I'm back to life. Hear the song awaken, all creation singing, you're alive, cause you're alive. You call me out of the grave, you call me into the light, you call my name and then my heart came alive. Your love is greater, your love is stronger. seat. Welcome to Three Rivers Church. We're so glad that you're here today, church family. It is good to see you. Hope you've had a great week, and if not, it is what it is. We have uh, something that gives us strength and encouragement uh, through the storms, and uh, we know from experience it's in the middle of the storms where we grow the most uh, because we have to really rely on our faith and something outside of us. If you're visiting with us today, we have a communication card that you can find in the back of your pew rack. Uh, fill that out, and you can put that in the very back corner. We've got uh, the offering plates that you can put those in. We also, in the hallway, have a mail slot in the wall that you can put that in. Church members, if you've got any information that needs to be updated or changed, you can use that as well. And as a reminder, on the back side is a huge blank space for prayer requests. And boy, do we need prayers. Amen? Matter of fact, uh, that's one of the things I think we can find ourselves so quickly lacking in in the busyness and hecticness of this life and this world as we can neglect our prayer life. We can uh, fast forward. It's kind of like being thankful. Once you start giving utterances of thanksgiving, you could go on for hours and hours just for thanksgiving. And when you start thinking about the people in this room and looking around the room and knowing how to be praying for one another, you could find yourself spending much time sharing with what they're going through. And there's people that need prayers right now. Amen? We just sang a song this morning that said, The Blessed Assurance. It's a great song. I love that song. But how about this for simplicity? This is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long.
regardless of the circumstances, he's worthy of our praise. And what's got us gathered here today is not this beautiful carpet. It is not the quality air condition. It is not this exciting backdrop that we see for our children's program coming up. But there's one thing that has us all assembled here today. And that is that we have given our life to Jesus Christ. We have put our faith in him. And we proclaim that he is Lord and Savior. And we worship him. And we are children of God. And as children of God, we want to grow and mature and be equipped. And we have a mission and we have a job. And there's a lost world waiting for us. So we're getting equipped today. Are you ready? We're going to worship and get equipped. And we're going to leave this place more mature, more equipped, and ready. And taking ownership of our responsibility as children of God. Father, we come before you. Lord, we give thanks. Thank you for the tithes and the offering. Lord God, may you give us wisdom and insight to use those to further your kingdom. Uh, Father, thank you that we have believers that we can walk through this life with, brothers and sisters in Christ that we can lean on, that we can share and joys and cast our burdens on one another. And Lord, we, uh, we want to make you the focus of our time here today. We want to worship you. We want to honor you. Lord, I pray that you be with the pastor today, give him boldness and to know that he is just a vessel being used by you to speak to us that we may grow in our relationship with your son, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray, amen.
thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide. Bring strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Blessed for mine with ten thousand beside. that this Sunday we're kind of short some of our regulars up here you know it's amazing when we get to just use our voices to praise our God and not hide behind the instruments it's a little bit harder sometimes for us up here but God has been so faithful and God has been so good I have 
all my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God Worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. And holy, there is no one like you there is none beside you open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. It is a firm foundation 
I will put my trust in you alone and I will not be shaken I will build my life upon your love it is a foundation I will put my trust in you alone and I will not be shaken holy there is no one like you there is none beside you open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me I will build my life upon your love it is a firm foundation I will put my trust in you alone and I will not be shaken I will build my life upon your love it is a firm foundation i will put my trust in you alone and i will not be shaken thank you please be seated Let there be light. That is like perfect timing. Way to go, guys. Uh, Welcome to Three Rivers Church. That was Pastor Zane and the dude what gave the announce, uh, the uh, welcome. That's Pastor Mark. I'm Pastor Ian. And uh, we are glad to be here. And we are really loud. That's so the people who stayed home can hear me. But if you want to turn down for the poor folks inside the house, that would be good because this is my quiet voice. Last week, Pastor Mark presented the difficult concept of hatred for Christ and the resultant hatred for those who belong to him. We are not of the world, so the world rejects us. Since the world persecuted Jesus, the world will persecute his followers. This demonstrates a hatred for Jesus and a resultant hatred for God. But even in the midst of all that trouble, Jesus provided the promise of the helper that would come, the spirit of truth that comes from the Father that will testify about Jesus, and that enables us to testify about Jesus too. This morning, Jesus tells his disciples some very troubling and confusing but also hopeful words. So turn your Bibles to John chapter 16. We're going to look at the first 15 verses this morning. Can you believe we're all the way in John chapter 16 after just a year and a half? There's 
there is no amount of time that will exhaust the depths that are found in God's word. And you can read ahead, it's okay. But act surprised when you hear the message. John chapter 16, have you found your place in God's word? Give me a hearty amen. amen. Here's what John writes. Quoting Jesus, these things I have spoken to you so that you may be kept from stumbling. They will make you outcasts from the synagogue, but an hour is coming for everyone who kills you to think that he is offering a service to God. These things they will do because they have not known the Father or me. But these things I have spoken to you so that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told you of them. These things I did not say to you at the beginning because I was with you. But now I am going to him who sent me, and none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. But I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And he, when he comes, will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. And concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you no longer see me. And concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you unto all the truth. For he will not speak of his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will disclose to you what is to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of mine and will disclose it to you. All things that the Father has are mine, therefore I said that he takes of mine and will disclose it to you. This morning's message I have called the promise. Will you pray with me? Father, we are grateful this morning, always grateful to be opening your word, to discover and mine the depths of treasure that are found therein. Lord, as we walk through these passages, maybe they are familiar to some. Lord, I pray that you would open our hearts and open our minds. Speak to us clearly. Father, that me, we may glorify you in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. We start with a warning. Don't you love warnings? I love Lost in Space, the old TV show where the robot would say, Danger! Danger, Will Robinson. And here's what John is saying. Jesus starts by saying, These things I have spoken so that you may be kept from stumbling. He provides a warning about what was to happen to them after he left. It was a very stern warning to keep them from stumbling. That word stumbling comes from the Greek phrase that means a baited trap. In this context, Jesus is warning them of the potential trap that they could fall into because of the hateful treatment of the world. Being treated hatefully because of what you believe is something Jesus wanted them to be prepared for. He didn't want them to focus on the treatment, but he wanted them to be ready when the time came. That sure is a lesson for us today, isn't it? Did you ever think you would come to a time in your life where for taking a stand for the truth of God, you would be called a hater or that things that you believe that we once honored as right and pure and good are considered hate speech? Don't let your heart be troubled. We should be prepared for this. I think many believers still find it shocking that they are maligned for what they believe in Christ. What I often see is this can come from within the church as well as outside the church. I'll speak just for me and my own experiences. I have been criticized by people in the church over the way I choose to follow Christ. I'm too loud. I'm too excited, I'm too passionate, I'm too funny. 
That, that wasn't a snicker. I mean, that's just what people say. I've had two people in my life tell me, you're just too funny. So one particular gentleman said, Pastor Ian, I really think when you open the word of God and you stand behind the pulpit, you need to be serious. That is a serious book that you're preaching, and you need to take it seriously and not write so many jokes into your sermons. And I said, well, I can show you, uh, I have been in vocational ministry since 2007, if you'll do the math, that is a bunch of years. You can look in all my printed messages, I print all my messages just like this because I don't want to forget and I don't want to go down too many trails where rabbits lead. You will find in what, uh, 2007, I don't know, how many years is it? Thank you, in 15 years you'll find maybe three illustrations that I've written down. What I give you comes off the top of my head from the Spirit of God. He said, you just need to be, you just need to cut that out, you need to be more serious. I said, so you want me to be serious in the pulpit, so you want me to be somebody who I am not. And he went, well, no. I said, look, you, this is, God knew what he got when he called me. When he implanted the, the passion and zeal for Christ, he knew my personality. He didn't say, oh, hey, Ian, you be somebody different. You be fake up in the pulpit. Man, what you see here in the pulpit is the same thing you get in my office. It's the same thing you get at my house. It's the same thing you get no matter where you see me. You get, this is what you get. If you don't like it, don't pitch a fit. Because you get what you get. Don't pitch a fit. You're too passionate. You're, you're, just too, you're just too excited. You're too loud. You're too boisterous. People criticize my decision to abstain from alcohol. Something I have the liberty to do, but somehow I have to justify why I use my liberty to abstain. Some people critique or criticize my dogmatic stance of, of Scripture. This is what the Bible says. I had someone come over to my house. Their children were having difficulty in their marriage. They said, Pastor Ian, we want you to come and counsel with them. I said, sure, I'll be glad to. I get over there, and they wanted me to approve their divorce. This is not getting along. That, that, that man that she's married to is horrible, and I want you to give them permission to get divorced. I said, I'm not going to do that. If you expected me to come here and tell you I approve of divorce when God hates it, you call the wrong guy. And she said, I guess we call the wrong guy. I've been called to the carpet for things that I have said that clearly and specifically align with Scripture. But Jesus provides this warning so we won't be caught off guard. Don't freak out. Where is this hateful treatment going to occur? Here's the shocking part. They will make you outcasts from the synagogue, but an hour is coming for everyone who kills you to think that he is offering service to God. That's very troubling to me. Unique to John's writings is the word outcast. We need to be reminded that John was writing in the first century, and synagogue worship was the thing of the day. The synagogue practiced at least two forms of discipline. A member could be disciplined for such things as dishonoring or opposing a teacher of the Torah. Wouldn't that be good? You oppose Pastor Zane? Oh, yeah. You're dishonoring Pastor Zane. You're dishonoring Pastor Mark, and we're going to call you to the carpet on it. We will exercise discipline, and that's going to come in the form of 30-day suspension from attending synagogue. 30-day suspension. Time could be extended. You could get in trouble for testifying against a fellow Jew in a non-Jewish court. During this time, you had to use a different entrance. You had to use the back door. You had to dress in a certain way so they know who was under discipline. Additional penalties for heresy could be 60 days. Those penalties included preventing the offending member from buying or selling, refusing to teach the offender's son a trade, refusing to heal them. This was serious business. But these degrees of sanctions could be lifted by synagogue officials. It wasn't permanent. 
In John 9, 22, remember the parents of the man that was healed of blindness from birth. Remember, they were threatened with suspension. In John 12, 42, the Bible says, many even of the rulers believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they were not confessing him for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue. Outcast is a stronger word. Jesus warned the disciples that they would be expelled from the synagogue. They would be kicked out of the place that was supposed to stand for truth, godliness, and holiness. And this ban is unreversible. Total expulsion. That is what the disciples have to look forward to after Jesus' death. Don't you think they're so excited about that? The rest of the verse, if you think that is bad, the rest of the verse is even more troubling when Jesus goes on to say, but an hour is coming for everyone who kills you to think he is offering service to God. Zealots, thinking they are doing God a service by killing people of faith. Simply kill those that are determined to have backward or heretical thinking. Just kill them. Now, I know that's challenging to comprehend, right? Challenging to think about. Well, let's look at some history. The first crusade was requested in 1095 by Pope Urban II at the Council of Claremont in an effort to stem the advance of Islam from the Middle East into Europe. The belief was that this was a holy work, pleasing to God. And then, of course, the one that everyone is familiar with, the wonderful Spanish Inquisition. They were looking primarily for heretics that converted from Judaism and Islam to Catholicism. In fact, there was even forced conversion to Catholicism. I mean, how do you force someone to convert? Well, because Catholicism, I don't want to rock your world, but... Catholicism isn't really a faith thing. It's more of a works thing. I'll be glad to chat with you about that at another time. There have always been misguided people in the world that passionately commit to something they deem is following the will of God. If you think that's ancient history, let me give you a more recent example of this behavior. During the beginning of the pandemic, do you remember... The pandemic. There's a pandemic, Rich, that it was not monkeypox. I think now we suffer from dumb pox, but that's a whole it's a whole different thing. At the beginning of the pandemic, many people lived in fear of catching the virus. I mean, we had people washing their hands so many times they're getting bloody. I mean, we were wiping things off they ain't never been wiped off. We were sanitizing a church. We are sanitizing. I mean, a kid looked at a table. There would be some come run up, sanitize that table. We had hand sanitizing stations all over the place. You just pump that stuff, rub it on, rub it in your hair. I mean, we were sanitized. We didn't know any better. This was the beginning. We, we were doing the best we could with the wonderful advice of the government. But I I will confess to you, I am not a doctor. I do know that washing your hands is good. They taught me that when I was a little kid. I blew it off. I mean, we drank out of the the garden hose. We ate apples straight off the tree. We ate cherries off the tree. I mean, we ate glue in school. I did not surely die. We ate and drank after one another. There was no 10-second rule. It's like, that looks good. We, I mean, I lived through it. In the beginning of the pandemic, people lived in fear. This led professing believers to say, if you don't wear a mask, you don't love people. Churches were being divided. The nation was being divided over mask or not mask. And if you remember us, what we said collectively, we said, if you want to wear a mask, fine, wear a mask. If you don't want to wear a mask, that's okay too. 
do whatever you want. Well, then the vaccine came out. Round two. If you don't get the vaccine, you don't love people. That is how, Pastor Ian, you demonstrate love for fellow man is by wearing a mask and getting the vaccine. And you remember, we said in unity that is nonsense. There is no gospel presentation where it's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and wear a mask. That's not how you demonstrate love to your neighbor. You demonstrate love to your neighbor by sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Doesn't have anything to do with masks, but yet we were on one side or the other, weren't we? We saw this all across the nation. Still, people in Three Rivers Church still are not back in the pews over fear of the virus. Thankfully, the virus doesn't go to the grocery stores, doesn't go to Walmart, doesn't go to Lowe's, doesn't go to the beach, doesn't go to the festivals where 15,000 germ-carrying people are wandering around, slobbering everywhere. Hallelujah, it doesn't get out anywhere, but it is thankfully confined to the church. I mean, that's a God thing there. Also, it doesn't sit at four feet. It only hangs out. It's, you know, between like four foot eight and six five. So if you're really tall, you're good. If you're really short, you're also good. That's why children don't need to wear masks. They fly under the virus stream. And if you think that's nonsense, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And perhaps the most concerning movement that is happening all around us is gaining ground. Adherence to this way of thinking view the Bible as lacking authority in favor of personal belief. Feelings and emotions are emphasized over fact. Essential Christian doctrines that have long been held as fundamental truths are open and encouraged for reinterpretation. Things like the virgin birth. Things like the physical resurrection of Jesus. Things like a literal hell. Things like the sexuality of man need to be viewed in a modern context and not the antiquated views of an ancient text created by man. Pastor Ian, I, I, I don't, I've never heard of that. Historic terms are redefined. Things like inerrancy. Authority and inspiration are redefined to mean what you want them to mean. Love is the ultimate characteristic of God and trumps all of his other qualities, including his hatred for sin. We can't talk about sin because God is love. So we must love everyone and this necessarily requires redefining sin. The primary focus of the church has shifted from the gospel of Jesus Christ to social justice. The idea that Jesus' death on the cross is what pastor and author Steve Chalk determined to be cosmic child abuse. He abandoned the essential doctrine of plenary substitution the idea is barbaric and unloving, he said, and we should focus our energy on promoting social justice and doing good works. This is what is called progressive Christianity. It is neither progressive nor Christian. It is utter bunk, nonsense, and it is sweeping through the Evangelical Church of America by people who ignore the truth of God's word. See, Jesus warned the disciples there'll be people who think they're serving God by causing their death. Remember, he's preparing them for that death that will come at the hand of religious zealots who have concluded that Jesus is a blasphemer and the only solution is to kill him. So what's the root cause of this overt action against Jesus and his followers? Look at verse 3. 
These things they will do because they have not known the Father or me. Followers of Christ are getting thrown out of the synagogues because the Jews don't know God. You cannot know God if you do not know Jesus. Remember his incredible words in John 14, 6, when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to me but through the Father. I'm sorry, hold on, let me back up. Don't tell me. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. There are no caveats. There are no special circumstances. There are no exceptions. The only way to get to God the Father is to go through Jesus Christ the Son. That is the only way. It's not a good way. It's not the American way. It's not the Camden County way. It's not the Three Rivers way. It is the way. Anyone, even people in North Camden County, can come to Jesus. Clemson fans, it's true. Pastor Mark loves the people in Mississippi that play football there, only half of them, because I always get I always get the two mixed up. He likes the University of Mississippi, right? The Rebels of Ole Miss, Hottie Toddy. Where I came from, Hottie Toddy meant something different. <laughs> Christians ought not partake in that. You can't have a relationship with God unless you go through Jesus. And the Jews reject Jesus. That's the source of their anger. That's the source of their hatred, their hostility. See, these things, Jesus says, I have spoken to you so that when their hour comes, you remember that I told you of them. Persecutions in the future. There's no escape for what will come. Jesus wants them prepared. And there's no indication that he is telling his disciples to run and hide there's no indication that he is changing their mission. If you've never suffered persecution because you are a follower of Christ, I wonder if anybody knows. Timing. Timing is everything, and Jesus explains why he's just now telling them. Don't you, wouldn't it be nice if he'd have told them this years ago? He says, these things I didn't say to you at the beginning... Because I was with you. The beginning refers to the beginning of their journey together. We're now at the end of their journey together, and Jesus is preparing them for what's to come. Now, it is getting ready. This is July the 17th, 2022, and we have parents in here who are preparing for school. They're getting their kids ready for school. Some of our students are going to middle school, the most troubled place on the planet. If you're a middle school teacher, God bless you. If you have students going to middle school, please tell me all of the kids who are in their classes, their parents' names and where they live, and we will protect them. It's a troubled place. There are parents getting ready to send their kids off to college. Troubling thing. He's preparing them for what is to come. If you're getting ready to go to college, be prepared for your beliefs to be challenged, for your purity to be challenged, for your holiness to be challenged, for your disciplines to be challenged. If you're getting ready to go in the military, be prepared for everything to be challenged. If you are getting ready to go to work tomorrow, be prepared to be challenged to what you believe. See, the disciples are having difficulty understanding what's going to happen even though they have walked with Jesus for three years. There's no chance they would have understood at the beginning what was getting ready to happen. It says, but now I'm going to him who sent me and none of you asked me where are you going. That seems, seems odd. Peter asked him where are you going in 1336. In 145, Thomas asked Jesus, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How, how do we know the way? 
It's not contradictions. It seems that was in a different setting than our current passage. For now, Jesus says, but because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. This is bad news to their ears. I mean, can you imagine being in that place, listening to Jesus, and he says, I am going away. You can't go with me. He says, sorrow filled your heart. What, what other emotion would there be? Jesus is their mentor, their friend, their savior, their closest confidant, and he's leaving. What other emotion but sorrow fills their heart? All they know, all they have experienced is going away. And they're thinking about what is to happen after he's gone. Verses 7 through 11 provide a dramatic turn of events. Jesus says, but I tell you the truth, it's to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And he, when he comes, will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment concerning sin because they do not believe in me and concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you no longer see me and concerning judgment because the ruler of this world has been judged. I tell you the truth is like an oath. Jesus promises that it is advantageous for him to leave. How will he leave? He will leave, we know, through his death on the cross. This is the glorification of Christ that John has mentioned throughout this gospel. This triggers the helper. Look at the three things the helper will do. He'll convict the world concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment. He spells it out. John spells it out. He explains it like this. Sin here is the overarching charge of not believing in Jesus Christ. If you don't believe in Jesus Christ, that will impact everything that you do. And we're not talking about belief that there is a Christ, a historical figure that has been proven as fact that there really was a person named Jesus Christ. He really was born of a virgin. He really did die on a cross. He really did raise from the dead. That is a historical fact. Sin, if you don't follow Jesus, it's very easy to ignore sin. No, that's, that's not. Why? How can you say that is sin? And we've often, you know, Ray Comfort does the way of the master. And let me just give you, you know, let me ask you a couple questions to show that you have sinned. You know, have you ever told, you, have you ever told a lie? Yeah, even a, even a white lie, which does not exist. And, you know, of course, the answer goes through, yes, I've, I've told a lie, I've taken something that wasn't mine, no matter what the value is, and that makes us a sinner. But when you redefine what sin is, then no one's a sinner and everybody is okay. I tell you the truth. Righteousness is the standard that the charge is given. We are judged based on a holy and perfect God we cannot measure up on our own. We cannot pay our own debt. You know, I serve as a bailiff in our court, in municipal court down here in St. Mary's, and I see all the time, can you pay that fine? I cannot. We'll put you on probation. All the city cares is that you pay the fine. There is a fine for our sin. There is a penalty for our sin, and that penalty is death. We cannot atone for our own sin. We can't pay for our own sin. That is the righteousness, the standard by which the charge is given. And judgment is complete. The ruler of this world has been judged. Satan is the ruler of the world, and he has had many, many victories. We've seen him in John. From his influence over the religious crowd to using Judas to betray Jesus. From our current state of affairs in this world, with all the anti-God rhetoric, the lack of zeal that many of his followers demonstrate, 
We know that Satan stands condemned and all those that submit to the world's powers stand condemned with him. If you don't understand that Satan is behind all of the things that are going on in this world, then you, my friend, are deceived. It is not your wayward Christian friend. It is Satan who still is convincing people that what they do is okay. And it is you now who are in the wrong for telling others what they should or should not do, and you are labeled as intolerant, a bigot, racist, judgmental, fill in the blank. That is what you are because you dare stand on the side of Jesus who is the Christ. He says, I have many more things to say to you, but you can't bear them now. I mean, can put yourself in the disciples' place. All these things, I mean, it's like, hey, I've got bad news and I've got worse news. And then on top of that, I got badder news. I mean, and then I'm going to tell you something really awful. And it's like, man, this, this passage should be the, the passage of buts. Have you looked at all the buts in here? But this, but this, but this, but this. And I'm thinking the disciples got to be saying, what? how could it get any worse? They're in total and utter confusion. And Jesus tells them, but wait, there's more. But you can't handle it now, so just push pause on this, guys. I'm going to tell it to you later. The last three verses give us insight into the practical workings of the helper that Jesus calls the spirit of truth. Now these words, please understand, are spoken directly to the disciples but they do have application for us. Look at verse 13. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak of his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will disclose to you what is to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of mine and will disclose it to you. All things that the Father has are mine, therefore I said that he takes of mine and will disclose it to you. The Spirit of God guides us to truth. As I have said on many occasions in our study of, God, uh, study of John, there is only one truth. There is not my truth. There is not your truth. There is only the truth. And there is absolute truth. Do not be ashamed to stick to absolute truth. There are simply man's and woman's in the world. There are two sexes in the world. It is a man slash boy. It is a woman slash girl. We are being maligned because we dare believe that there are just two sexes. Don't sweat it. Don't worry about it. Don't engage in it. Just say, look, it's, it's biology, man. It's DNA. And then move on. If you can't come to an agreement that there's just a man and a woman, I'm pretty sure you ain't going to agree on what sin is. Don't freak out. There's only, only truth. And the Spirit's going to guide you to that truth. You've heard us say before, if you don't know what to do in a certain situation, pray about it. I mean, this is what we should be doing, right? Prayer should be our our first choice, whether it's opportunity, whether it's where to go, you know, to, to college, take a new job, whatever it is, pray about it. The Lord will guide you. And most of the decisions we make are not between good and bad. Should I rob this bank or should I go to work today? That's not a, that's not a decision we make. We make decisions between good and better or bad and better more better sometimes the choices are between absolutely ho horrible and really really bad we're not faced with the we're, we're just not faced with these dire you know left versus right questions and it's always it's always something dumb like well if you had to kill that person would you I, I, you know, I don't know. Why don't we face the situation? 
that we have now. Should I pray this morning and do my devotion, or should I sleep in? We never, we never pray about that stuff. Should I hit my snooze alarm for the 14th time? No. How about just get up? You lack of disciplined people, you. How many of you, don't, don't show me your hands, how many of you factor in the number of times you'll hit the snooze into your alarm? Don't show me your hands, but I know who you are because you're late all the time. And if church starts at 10.30, just FYI, that's not the time you leave your house. Right? Leave your, leave your house. Depending on where you live. Leave your house to be here 10.15. Well, Pastor Ian, that's 15 minutes early. You get better parking places. I get the premier spot every single Sunday because I'm here first. Park right over there. How do you think I get the same spot all the time? No one's here at 6.15 except me because I get up when my alarm goes off. Pastor Ian, that's stupid. It's not. If you're not disciplined to do the small things, what makes you think you're going to be disciplined to do the big things? If you can't get out of bed to get to, to church at Three Rivers at 10.30 in the morning, God help you. I mean, I'm serious. 10.30 in the morning. You, I mean, I could... I could fix all y'all's hair before 10.30. Now, what's going to happen next week, I, I can see it now. There's going to be people lining them up. Pastor, will you fix my hair? Zane, I'm fixing yours first. John, I got you in there, buddy. I'll do both y'all at the same time. The Spirit guides you to truth. Listen. If you are a believer that is passionate, outward, people know that you're a follower of Christ, you will get asked questions. You will get asked for advice. Hey, can you help me out? Can I tell you about something? Can I talk to you? When we counsel with others, and that's what counseling is, you are simply talking with people. One of the most challenges thing, cha one of the most challenging things that is presented is something that I call playing the Holy Spirit card. When someone tells me something like, "Pastor, I feel led to do this," what they're saying is, "This is what I'm going to do." I'm attaching the influence of the Holy Spirit on it, and you cannot say anything about it. I hear it all the time. Oh, Pastor, I just I feel like the Lord has led this woman into my life. Mm, I don't I don't not only do I not think so, I will absolutely say that is an absolute lie. Pastor, you know, I just feel led to. Really? What does your wife think about that? These are actual conversations. Don't give me that nonsense. Oh, the Holy Spirit led me to do something two weeks ago, led me to do something different ten days ago, something different six days ago, something different this Oh, the Lord's just leading me to stay out of church for a while. Nonsense! You're being judgmental and legalistic. No, I'm just, being, I'm just being real. Do you really think that God has called the church to be one of the institutions that he founded for you as a follower of Christ not to be a part of? Do you really think you can do it on your own? I will tell you with the authority of Scripture, you cannot do it. You need people in your life that are followers of Christ. When you're down, they pick you up. When you're weak, they make you strong, and they do it all through the power of God. Don't tell me the Lord has led you to do something that's contrary to his word. I will call you a liar straight to your face. Pastor Jim, that's harsh. What do you want me to say? Oh, gosh, okay, you know... If you want to have an affair, oh, God bless you. I just hope it's wonderful. And then you go home, you have an affair, and your wife kills you, and then that's on me. Not going to happen. Don't play the God card with me if you're prepared to stick to it. And if you think I'm just talking, 
uh, like some theory. I can tell you things that God told me to do. I did not waver, and I got hammered for it when it actually happened. This is what I'm going to do. And it didn't change. Now, I'm not talking about it didn't change for days. Talk to leadership. This is what God is leading me to do. This is what I believe he has told me to do. And it didn't change for several, well, it's a year and a half-ish. This is what I'm going to do. And then when that happened, that thing came to fruition. I did exactly what God told me to do, and I got hammered for it. You can't do that. This is what God told me to do. You don't like it? Then that's tough on you. I told you this was what was going to happen. God is not wishy-washy. God does not change his mind every 15 minutes with your life. What a terrible life to live. I don't know what God wants me to do today. Uh, it's different than yesterday. For most of us, it's do, be, just, just do the very best you can wherever you are. Be the, be the very best you can. Colossians 3, 23, whatsoever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord, not unto man. If you're an electrician, man, twist them wires good. Put that wire nut on tight. Make sure it's not loose. If you're a teacher, love them kids. Teach them the curriculum. Make sure they're learning. Make it fun. I loved school. I don't remember a lot about school, but I think I liked it. Whatever you're doing, do it the best you can. You're in the military? Be the biggest stud muffin in your unit. When people give you a job, Chad, they know. Man, Chad's on it. He'll get it done. I don't even need to check up on him. Oh, that Randy guy? Man, I don't really know a lot about him, but give him something to do. It's going to get done right, and he ain't going to complain about it. We should be known as the premier workers because we're seeking to please Christ. I get a little bit passionate. I know. That's bad. The Spirit... What he says is not independent of what Jesus says. He's not going to tell you something contrary to what Jesus or God says. I really believe, Pastor Ian, that the Lord has led this woman into my life. And I believe I married the wrong woman. God help you. Don't come to me for advice. Well, probably after this, you're not going to anyway. <laughs> I just want to go to someone that tells me everything I'm doing is right. I'm not, you know, I'm not your grandparent. You'll get that in a second because you know everything Kinsey does is absolutely awesome. She's my granddaughter. He will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he whatever he hears, he will speak. Anything you say that's contrary to God's word does not hear me. Anything you say that is contrary to God's word absolutely does not come from the Spirit. Does not, will not, cannot, ain't ever going to happen. In the beginning, God created man. Male and female, he created them. Anything that's contrary to that did not come from the Spirit of God. I don't care what church teaches it. I don't care what pastor teaches it. They are absolutely wrong. We, as long as us three dudes are here, you are not going to hear any other teaching other than that. And if that offends people and they won't come here, y'all, they weren't going to be happy here anyway because we're just crazy enough to teach what's in God's word and that's what we believe even when it's hard to understand even when it's hard to do that's what we're going to do it's what we're going to do so if you don't like that you know we will be sorry to see you go but you ain't going to be happy here when we take that dogmatic authoritarian stance over what scripture says it ain't changing the spirit will glorify me Jesus said for he will take of mine and disclose it to you all things that the father has are mine Therefore, I said that he takes of mine and will disclose it to you. This completes what one scholar calls the communication triad. God speaks to Jesus, who speaks to the Spirit, who speaks to his followers. That's why saying something is from God that is not is really, really bad. I believe with all my heart that God speaks in this manner. He can still speak to our hearts through the power of the Spirit, but he will never, ever, ever tell you something that is contrary to his word. Never. 
we need to learn to discern the difference between the spirit of God and the spirit of the world. Because there are things that are accepted in the church now that even 10 years ago, we would have been horrified. And now it's just like, yeah, whatever. Jesus knows and understands the disciples are confused. They're confused about what's going to happen. Now, in this point in John, it's just in the next few days. We've covered a lot of ground in these first 15 chapters, and it's gone pretty slow, but now, I mean, it's going to, we will absolutely stick in one period of time that is only a few days long. Even though what he says is difficult to hear, he doesn't want them to be shocked when it happens. That's why we tell our kids, we prepare them for what is to occur. They're going to be thrown out of the synagogues. They're going to be made outcasts. They're going to die at the hands of zealots that think they're doing the will of God. There is no place in the where, nowhere in Scripture where it says, kill those that do not believe in me. You're not going to find it. But we do find things that say, love your enemies. Pray for those that persecute you. That's what we find. See, the fundamental cause for all these things is because of those that do not know God or Jesus. Lost people act lost because they are lost. How else do you expect them to act? Love folks. Teach them the truth. Oh, I, I wouldn't know what to say. I wonder how many people have crashed the gates of hell because they came across believers that just didn't know what to say to them. All you have to do is open your mouth and trust that the Spirit of God will give you the words that you need to say. You would stop a stranger from walking across the street to get hit by a car, wouldn't you? I believe everyone, everybody in here would do what they could to stop them or prevent them from walking in front of a bus. But we have people bound for hell that we just let them go. All you got to do is say, hey, here's a, here's, a good, here's a good opening statement. Especially if you're talking about, you know, you're wearing a football shirt and it's, oh, you like the rebels. Oh, I do. That reminds me of the rebellious nature of your spirit. But there's, no, I don't use that one. You can use anything to segue and make that thing spiritual. A good question, hey, are you connected with the local ministry? If you're a follower of Christ, you will know that that means a church. If you're not a follower of Christ, they will say, no, what does that mean? And there's your opportunity. And you're just talking about church. And then that transitions into a into a more intimate conversation about why, why would I need to go to church? Oh, the church is this and this and this and this. Well, I can get that at home. Probably not because God tells us this. There are ways to spiritualize any conversation. All you got to do is be willing. And you have those conversations a lot. You just don't realize it. Jesus provides the hope in the form of the helper, the spirit of truth that will speak the words of Christ that offers encouragement, comfort, and strength, but he will not come unless Jesus goes away. That naturally caused great sorrow in the hearts of the disciples. All this has happened. All this is going to happen, and we are privileged to know the time. But for the disciples, uncertainty rules the day. But this uncertainty, as we'll see, will be replaced with determination and resolve. Will you pray with me? Lord, I know that this likely is a challenging, challenging message to hear. Lord, we do have a responsibility. We who know the truths of God, who the truths of Christ, the truth of your word. Lord, we have a responsibility and a privilege to share those truths with those that really need to hear it. So Lord, I pray that you would give us opportunities and not just opportunities, but Lord, that you would make us aware when those opportunities present themselves. And that we would just 
courageously share the truth of who you are. Lord, we want to bring glory to your name through our lives. So Lord, help us to do that. For all the work that you accomplish in us and through us, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your strength, your wisdom. Lord, we thank you for absolute truth that we can really know. So Lord, help us to be loving to those that we come into contact with. Help us to not be judgmental or intolerant, but just, Lord, be firm, never wavering from the truth. Lord, help us to understand that people who do not know the truth of Christ already have their hearts set against you. So Lord, I pray that you would prepare people to be receptive to the truth of who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Just one word You calm the storm that surrounds me Just one word The darkness has to retreat Just one touch I feel the presence of heaven Just one touch, my eyes were open to see, my heart can't help but believe, there's nothing that our God can't do, there's not a mountain that he can't move, oh praise the name that makes a way, there's nothing that our God can't do, just one word. You heal what's broken inside me Just one word You revive every dream Just one touch I feel the power of heaven Just one touch my eyes were open to see my heart can't help but believe there's nothing that our god can't do there's not a mountain that he can't move oh praise the name that makes a way there's nothing that our god can't do there's nothing that a God can't do. There's not a prison wall he can't break through. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that a God can't do. There's nothing that a God can't do. There's not a mountain that he can't move. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can't do. There's nothing that our God can't do. There's not a prison wall he can't break through. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can't do. have a seat let me tell you what's going on this week if you're wondering what in the world is going on here that is set up for our backstage kids musical that will be presented next Sunday night at 6 p.m. we would love to see you here we are going to stream it but the camera just does not do justice to the kids so come here and get to hear them sing and there will be drama and it will be a wonderful time that's next sunday at six o'clock and we need some help for backstage kids if you'll see debbie raise your hand and wave there's debbie back there uh, she needs some volunteers to help with food prep and cleanup from four o'clock in the afternoon next sunday until it's over at about eight when everything is done we're also looking for donations of things like cookies chocolate chip uh, we need cupcakes, chocolate on chocolate, brownies without nuts, muffins, blueberry is good, uh, or, you know, whatever kind of things like that uh, that you'll bring. 
and that will be provided after. There'll be snacks after Backstage Kids uh, in the Fellowship Hall. So if you can donate that stuff or you want to help, please see Debbie because she would love for you to help out. Uh, now, after Backstage Kids is over, there's this thing that we do here on Wednesday nights called Awana. Awana stands for Approved Workmen Are Not Ashamed. It's a wonderful Bible memorization ministry for kids. It teaches them about God. They memorize God's word. They hide it in their hearts. And uh, lots of wonderful things that happen on Wednesday night in Awana. There's just one minor little hiccup, Pastor Zane. We need people. We need at least six volunteers to, to, to volunteer in that ministry or else we will have to make a decision that will not be popular for all the kids that are registered. But we got to have the number of people in order to safely and effectively guide our kids. So if you want to volunteer and work in Awana, please see Pastor Zane Owen, Zen, 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 or Vicki. Vicki is in the back. Wave your hand. Come on, be more emphatic. There's Vicki. You almost hit Dan. There's Vicki in the back. So two people you got to see this morning are Debbie and Vicki. Debbie for food and Vicki for Awana. And then she will plug you in. We need help in all areas of Awana on Wednesday nights. And that is going to start on a day in the future. August 17th. Because school starts in like two weeks now, right? Sabrina, you are not looking happy, girl. Marsha's, I think Marsha's happy. Marsha's excited. Nicole, you're happy? Mark, are you happy? Mark is, uh, so I, he was so excited. I saw Mark's truck parked there at the Crook River Elementary yesterday at like six in the morning. It, he was at school six in the morning. Or the, yeah, if you're the worm, you're just gonna get pecked on. Um, so please take care of that. And uh, we've got merchandise for sale out there in the foyer. You can Venmo that. And then there's something else that we're doing through our ESL ministry. ESL stands for English as a Second Language. We're currently working with Spire Church in Jacksonville, teaching English as a Second Language to, uh, golly, there's uh, Ukrainians, Syrians, Afghans. Uh, there's people from all over the globe that are learning English as a Second Language. Well, if you're not aware of what's going on in Ukraine, there's a war over there. And so uh, when the borders opened, lots of people fled Ukraine from the war, and they have landed a pile of them in Jacksonville. So a couple weeks ago, Carrie and I and Misty went to uh, a church, and we uh, met with several Ukrainian families on what their needs are. And their needs are many. Now, I want you to think about the comfort you have a lot of these families literally fled Ukraine with what was on their backs. That's all they have. So they have needs like, you know, anything that you think you need to live life, they need way more. They need shoes and clothes and diapers and mops and buckets and irons and lions and tigers and bears. And they need everything. And you know what their kids are getting ready to do? Their kids are getting ready to go to school. So not only are they in a, in a place where they are having difficulty working, now listen to this, it takes up to six months for one of these refugees to get a work permit to work in the United States. They want to work, but they are not allowed to by our wonderful government. But if you're illegal, oh man, we're going to give you health benefit. Well, no, don't even get me started. <laughs> but refugees, they're not allowed to work. So they're dependent on other people to provide for their needs, even basic needs like toothbrush and toothpaste. So Carrie and Misty will put out uh, words. I, I don't know exactly how the word's going to get put out, uh, and I think it already has been put out something, but those are, the, those are where those needs are coming from. That stems from English as a Second Language Ministry that we also will be beginning here at Three Rivers in the fall. Brenda and Dylan are uh, very, very faithful. Ella is also one of our folks. Debbie is one of our ESL folks. Uh, who else do we have? Uh, Dan Tromler up in the sound booth, he also helps with that. So ESL is coming in the fall. Look, y'all, we have a lot of needs here in our own ministries, including children's church. A lot of our children's church workers, if you notice, Carrie left uh, before I ended, and it wasn't because she was mad at something I said. 
it was because she had to run back to help Amelia, my daughter, in children's church. So some of our children's church workers are doing sometimes double duty during the month. And you're thinking, well, man, that's, uh, that's their calling. Are you telling me you can't teach a Bible lesson to an eight-year-old and see the wonderment in their eyes at the first time they ever heard a good Bible story? We got the curriculum. We'll give it to you. You can look at it. Uh, all you got to do is have a willingness. We'll teach you how to volunteer in children's church or nursery. Who doesn't love babies? Where's Natalie right now, Aaron? In the nursery. Look, well, uh, welcome, Natalie. <laughs> what a wonderful arrival. But, you know, you've got Peter and Daniel back there. We've got little kids that, uh, that need to be cared for in the nursery. And we can't really let them go by themselves. Even with like a responsible two-year-old, we apparently are not allowed to do that. So we need volunteers to watch our kids. So we need, look, if you want to serve, and every follower of Christ should be serving in some capacity, every single, there ain't no caveats, no exceptions. Everybody should be serving. So just ask yourself, where are you serving at Three Rivers? Maybe you have a good smile and you want to be a greeter. See Eric or Wanda. They'll put you on the greeter schedule. Maybe you're good with your hands and you can do some work. I'll put you to work on the building or out in the field or something. We've got things for you to do. All you got to do is come and let us know because we are coming for you. Okay? If you're breathing, you will get asked at some point very soon by either Pastor Mark, Pastor Zane, or me to do something. And we will say something like, will you consider serving in this area? And if you say, well, I'll pray for about six or eight months about it, we'll just say, all right, never mind. We want you to serve, and there is a place for you to serve, okay? Uh, as you can see, we also were a little light in the band. My son-in-law, I got called into work. Nick is doing some dumb vacation thing. Robbie has the Rona. That's a still thing? How do you know if you have it? Don't, don't take the test, you people. <laughs> Rona's not a thing anymore. Uh, so we've got lots of people. And, you know, people do go on vacation. Uh, some of y'all go on vacation like every month. I don't know what in the world you're doing. But um, I did just book a vacation for us. Carrie and I are going to a family reunion uh, July 2023. So... That's what we'll be doing. That'll be the first one in like three years. So uh, I think that's it. I have kept you long enough. It's 12.03. I hope you all have a wonderful afternoon. Let's stand. We're going to go home. Some of you are going to go home via the restaurant. So tell everybody hi. Pray for your server. And uh, I hope you all have a wonderful day. We'll see the youth back here, Converge Youth, at 5 o'clock. That's 1,700 for the military kids and you'll have a wonderful time in God's word. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful, Lord, for all that you provide. And I, I, I know our needs are great. But Lord, we trust that you are going to provide. Lord, if you want our Awana ministry to continue, Lord, you're going to provide the leaders. We are not trying to guilt or shame anyone. But Lord, we want our folks to know that there is a place of service, that they can serve you by serving in the church. So Lord, I pray that you would provide for us as you have provided for us in the past, we know that you will do so in the future. Lord, thank you for all that has occurred this morning, for your glory, for your honor. And Lord, as we leave this place, as always, I pray that we would found to be doers of God's word and not hearers only. In Jesus' name, amen.